Alors, euh, je suis du comité organisateur, Mass Critique, c'est un collectif au sein de l'Université de qui se voue à l'éducation populaire sur trois grands thèmes la critique du système capitaliste, on met de l'avant le co-socialisme, la tentative de lier écologique et socialiste, écologique et équité sociale, et bien sûr l'appui au pas anglais, donc l'anti-impérialisme. Ce sont les trois grands thèmes sur lesquels notre groupe agit de façon constante, surtout par le biais de conférences au sein du MICA, et aussi par le biais de projections de films sous le nom de Cinéma Militant, nous organisons des projections de films au cinéma du parc chaque quelques semaines. Alors, l'activité de ce matin est appuyée par le groupe pro socialiste et notre camarade Denis Mandel a été crucial dans l'organisation de cette conférence, puisque ça nous prenait un professeur. Non seulement nous avons le professeur Mandel, mais aussi l'appui de son département, le CERS politique. Et donc, euh, nous remercions David de son appui, du travail important qu'il a fait pour ce matin. Alors, bien sûr, nous avons avec nous Sam, Sam Dindé. Pour ceux qui ne le connaissent pas, c'est non seulement un intellectuel, c'est-à-dire un professeur à l'université de l'Ordre, mais ce qui nous intéresse énormément dans son cas, c'est qu'il a été militant syndical pendant très longtemps. Pendant au-delà d'un quart de siècle, de 1974 à 2000, il était conseiller économique aux travailleurs, à l'époque, travailleurs unis d'automobile, qui sont devenus par après le syndicat canadien, les travailleurs canadiens d'automobile, Et ça, est en fait devenu à la fin du conseil des présidents de Worldwide depuis trois ans. Alors ça nous représente ce type d'intellectuel particulièrement intéressant, qui non seulement peut faire l'analyse fine de la crise économique, mais aussi nous orienter vers certaines pistes d'action. Hein, certains éléments de lutte, certaines orientations de lutte. Et donc, c'est ce que nous allons entendre ce matin de la part de ça. Comme j'ai eu le privilège d'entendre sa conférence hier, il y a trois grands points euh, sur lesquels ça me met l'accent qui sont pas particulièrement intéressants pour nous. Un, c'est la fonction du système financier dans le capitalisme aujourd'hui. Ça a des choses très intéressantes à dire sur cela et sur l'impact que cela a sur les luttes populaires contre le système. Deuxièmement, il démontre l'importance de s'attaquer au système financier, puis il soulève la question de la nationalisation des banques, éventuellement comme du monde, comme revendication, comme tel plus. Et troisièmement, certaines pistes de réflexion sur les façons de pouvoir unifier les luttes populaires et ouvrir au niveau du compte du système. Alors je vous passe ça à Merci. Merci. I'm pleased to be here and I hope that uh, these kinds of discussions will take place between uh, the left in English Canada and the left in uh, Quebec in the future. Uh, we're in the middle of an uh, of a historic moment. Uh, we're in the middle of the greatest crisis since the Great Depression and we still don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, I'll have some things to say about it, but I just want to emphasize that we don't know how it will turn out. One of the things about crises is that there are interruptions in the regular daily life, severe interruptions in daily life, and therefore they raise new questions, they raise all kinds of new opportunities as well. And uh, one, one of the things that's obviously happening is that there's been a delegitimation of the uh, corporate elite, people who were paid amounts that are very difficult to understand uh, and were heroes earlier because apparently they were allegedly paid these amounts because of how smart they were, how much they contributed uh, to the economy, have been delegitimated. There's been a discrediting of the world view of neoliberalism and markets to a large extent, at least ideologically, uh, and, and the promises that that brought. And this has created an opening on the left. At the same time, however, and I think it's crucial to appreciate this, the kind of openings that crises imply are also openings for the right. Um, there's also there's going to be a, a crucial question of who's going to pay for this crisis. We're going to find out that uh, the restructuring that's going on and the stimulus that's going on isn't necessarily progressive. You can have neoliberal restructuring and a neoliberal kind of uh, stimulus 
we're already seeing that even though the official policy is that we need to stimulate demand to get the economy going again almost everywhere in the world, the reality in capitalism is that corporations are trying to survive. And as they try to survive, they're actually cutting wages, laying off workers, and countering what the official policy is. And one of the issues uh, as this crisis unfolds is going to be that we are going to see uh, not just talk of stimulus, but also a restructuring from the perspective of capital. We're already seeing this in terms of the unions, uh, in, in terms of what's happening to unions like the UAW in the US and the CAW in Canada, in terms of effectively destroying them as an independent force. So the question of what happens in a crisis doesn't necessarily mean at all that something progressive will happen out of it. And the challenge for us at this particular moment is not just how we defend ourselves from this, but I think the crucial question is how do we build the independent capacity to come out of this in a way that's stronger, and in a way that uh, builds the ability to actually increase the options. Uh, I think the most important point about the last quarter of a century has, uh, has been the defeat of the left. And, and, and the, the crucial point about that defeat isn't that wages were restrained or there was some privatization. The crucial point has been that there's been a lowering of expectations. That's the real defeat of the trade union movement and the left more generally. And the question for us is going to be how to overcome that. And to overcome, by, by that, I don't just mean that we get back to the kind of expectations that may have existed in the 70s. I actually mean that we're not just going to have to reverse that lowering of expectations, we're going to have to have radical expectations. We're going to have to radicalize our expectations because it's, it, it is impossible to think about responding to this challenge and building anything else unless we think about radicalizing our demands. And we should take a lesson from what is happening within capital. If you look at what capital is doing today, it's more radical in, in a particular sense than it's ever been. It's dropping money from helicopters on the banks. It's got zero interest rates that it's never had before from the Fed. It's doing stimulus like has never happened before. They're even talking about nationalizing the banks, but in a very particular way. Uh, this is a radical period. They're going to respond radically, and we have to think about what does that mean for us. So what I want to talk about is, first of all, how do we understand the crisis we're in? I want to make some points about that. But the main point I really want to get to is how do we respond? And just have, I just want to present some thoughts on thinking about it. I don't want to pretend that I've got a solution. Uh, solutions are something we have to collectively work out after this vacuum in what we've been doing generally over a quarter of a century. So I want to start with some comments about how we think about uh, the present crisis. Um, first of all, I think it would be a mistake to see this crisis as reflecting a weakness of capital. Uh, when, when, you, when, when you interpret things in terms of capital being weak, there's always a tendency to think that, well, maybe we just need to strengthen them and things will get uh, better again. The reality is, is that capital has been very strong. The reality of the last quarter of a century is that there has been more restructuring in terms of the making of capitalism than almost at any period in history. And I mean that in every dimension. I mean that spatially, in terms of globalization, in terms of their ability to penetrate every country, and to transform states in every country so that they support global accumulation. I mean that the integration of Eastern Europe and the integration of China. I mean that at home in terms of the commodification of all kinds of services uh, and the privatization, not complete, but, but the tendency to do that, or at least to put a ceiling on the kind of uh, development of the welfare state that wasn't trained before. I mean that culturally, in terms of uh, the spread of values that have become a new common sense about individualization. I mean that in terms of how the working class has been integrated, the working class uh, aren't just workers right now, but they're also uh, creditors, they're investors, uh, they're dependent on the stock market for their pensions, they're dependent on housing prices, uh, also in the sense of seeing this as building their savings for the future 
uh, the future security, for education for the kids, or for their pensions. So capitalism has been incredibly dynamic in terms of restructuring all our lives in the interests of that narrow goal of accumulation, and it's been able to do this with the minimal of resistance. It's quite remarkable how little resistance there has been to this transformation about everything in our lives. So we have to start off by understanding how powerful capital has been, not that it's been weak, it's in crisis right now, but it's not because of its weakness. And if you look at it just in terms of just narrower economic terms, and you ask the question about profits, for example, uh, profits in 2006 in the United States, Canada tracked this uh, quite closely, uh, the share of going to profits was at the peak. Uh, profit rates were uh, uh, not at the peak of 1965, but they were very strong compared to historical rates. They've been rising quite steadily. Uh, executive compensation, which when I came to the union, uh, it was about 40 to 1 in terms of a top executive compared to an auto worker, and we thought that was incredible. How could any society have that kind of inequality and consider it democratic? It's closer to 400 to 1. The this crisis and increased about 10 tenfold, which basically means if auto workers had kept up with auto executives, an auto worker would be making $300 an hour today. So capitalism is strong. I just want to emphasize that. The goal can't be to strengthen capital. The second thing I want to emphasize is that uh, we're not seeing the end of the American Empire. You can't interpret what we're seeing as the end of the American Empire. And if anything, I'd argue that what we're actually seeing is a confirmation that the U.S. is at the center of the empire. What happens in the U.S. affects everybody. Uh, everybody is dependent on looking to what the American state now does to get everybody out of it. Uh, the crisis ends up, soon will, it hasn't yet affecting the third world more than it affects the United States. It's already starting to have deeper repercussions in Europe than just handed in the United States. And the most important signal of this is how the dollar remains at the center of the global economy. In spite of this crisis starting in the United States, and a lot of people thinking that, well, as soon as it happens, all this debt that the United States has, all the money that it borrows, people will pull it out. Quite the opposite has happened. When you get insecurity, uh, people rush in to the dollar. Uh, they're not being forced to do this. This is because they see the U.S. dollar as safer. And uh, as the head of the Chinese Banking Commission uh, said a couple of days ago, except for U.S. treasuries, what else can you hold? Basically, they're locked into this. Uh, and if people want me to elaborate a little bit on this, uh, I will later. Uh, the second thing I want to emphasize, the third thing I want to emphasize, so it's not, it's not because capital is weak, it's not because it's, the, it's not the end of the U.S. empire, and it's not the death of neoliberalism. And I want to really stress this, because a lot of people have seen neoliberalism as somehow the state versus markets, and that if you have more state, somehow it's the end of neoliberalism, or if you have more regulation, it's the end of neoliberalism. The state has been involved in the economy over the last quarter of a century to an enormous degree. The American financial system is actually more regulated than any other, than most other financial systems. Uh, it's not states versus markets. The point of neoliberalism was to speed up the development of capitalism, remove barriers, like social barriers, to capital accumulation and to profits. That's what neoliberalism is about. It's about the state using markets and markets using the state to discipline. And that's partly why finance is so important, because finance is abstract capital. It can move so quickly and immediately, and therefore act in this disciplining force, which I'll get back to in a second. So, you know, the kind of regulation that people are talking about now is not social regulation of the banks. It's about fixing the banking system so they can get back to normal. This isn't something we should feel good about. Uh, so we have to understand that neoliberalism is still there. Some of this is emerging just spontaneously, as I mentioned before. Uh, in order to deal with their own survival, corporations are going to handle workers more than they did before. We're going to see more of market discipline on workers in terms of restructuring, wages, layoffs, permanent insecurity, uh, pressures on the question of, uh, of equality. But uh, we're also seeing it directly from the state. When they did the auto subsidies, part of the condition for GM getting money was that auto workers match the standards of Toyota, which is kind of a remarkable thing if you see this as the state getting out of things. The state is saying that a union has to match 
what a non-union operation does in wages, benefits, and working conditions. And they named the companies. They said uh, Toyota, Honda, Nissan. And they didn't just say general maps. They said uh, wages, benefits, working conditions. Uh, and then you basically have the Canadian government talking about the same thing for another country. So, so that's, it's directly built into what the state is, is doing. And we're even seeing it in Ontario. I'm not familiar with what, what's happening in Quebec. The argument is, yes, we need stimulus, but we have to cut wages in the public sector. A, because it's only fair that we're cutting them in the private sector, but that's how we're going to get the money to do infrastructure. So we shouldn't think that we're seeing the end of neoliberalism. We really have to appreciate what we're uh, going to be facing. Um, <coughs> now, the final thing I just want to say on this, before getting to what I think the crisis is about, is we shouldn't just kind of accept uh, easy descriptions of the crisis. Well, it's all about debt, and there's too much debt. We have to be careful about this. Uh, the corporations, right, the non-financial corporations, went into this crisis basically in good shape. If you look at their balance sheets, they weren't in uh, debt. It's nothing like 1978, 79, when they were really heavily into debt. So the corporations haven't actually been in debt. And it's understandable why. Productivity has been high, wages have been restrained, so the profits have been high, they've been able to invest out of their profit. Um, the profit. Uh, the government deficit of the U.S., especially, uh, in Canada we have surplus, and in the U.S. they did have a deficit, but it wasn't a problem, because the problem is never the deficit, it's the nature of the deficit. Capital doesn't care, and the Wall Street Journal doesn't complain if you have a deficit that's based on lowering taxes to the rich or paying for an imperial war. Nobody complains about that. They only complain about it if the deficit is there because you're raising public sector wages or increasing social programs, because then it shows that you're not disciplined, that you're giving in to public pressures. So the American deficit wasn't a problem for investors or for anybody else. That wasn't a problem, and even for workers, uh, it's a mixed bag. People have gotten into more debt, that's for sure. But if you look at it, in 1980, uh, uh, the, uh, the average worker, or I shouldn't say average worker, the average for the economy was that people were paying about 11% of their income for debt charges. In other words, the interest payments on their credit, mortgages, etc. And now it's about 14%. It's gone up, it's gone up quite significantly, but it isn't. Uh, the major source of the crisis, and this was actually quite sustainable until the end of the 90s. Uh, where the debt has really mattered has been in mortgages, and, I, and I, I'm going to get into that now by talking about the financial crisis. Uh, I just want to read something before I get into the financial crisis. I'm going to read the statement. The speculative imbalances in the housing market, the tremendous increase in mortgage debt, and the large dollar overhang abroad have made our present situation precarious. Now that was said in 1980, long before the crisis happened, and it was said by Alan Greenspan, who was the head of the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank in the United States, and a person who was accused you know, of, of saying that uh, he wasn't worried about the debt, uh, and had lowered interest rates to such an extent that it stimulated the housing bubble. And the reason I'm emphasizing this point uh, isn't to make any point about Greenspan, it's simply to make the point that everybody knew that there was a potential problem, there was something precarious about this debt, going back to 1980, and uh, actually in the, in the 70s. And then you can get quotes like that from the 60s, and you can get quotes like that from the 50s, when people began to buy on, on credit. So the question is, well, if everybody knew this, why was anything happening about it? People aren't stupid. These are investors. They're saying, hey, this is a risky business we're getting into. Uh, and, and, and I want to say, you know, there was a social base that saw all this credit as functional to capitalism and to their own self-interest, and that includes the working class. So let me just summarize this very quickly. Finance isn't just speculation. Of course there's speculation in finance. But finance is much more than speculation. It performs a function crucial to the, to the rest of capital. It's supported by the rest of capital. When interest rates rose, I was making this point yesterday, when interest rates rose in 1979 to 80, 81 to 18%, and it was killing the auto industry, 
because people couldn't get their loans on cars and because suppliers couldn't get credit, the auto industry supported the strength of finance. And it supported it because it understood that in order to get out of the crisis of the 70s, you needed to break the back of labor and you needed to restructure the economy, and Keynesianism wasn't capable of doing that. To do that, you had to depend on finance and discipline and market discipline that finance was going to implement. So there's a class interest. And what business gets out of the strength of finance is, first of all, if you're going to be global, you need global finance to service you. Uh, if you're going to be global, you're facing all kinds of uncertainties, like what's going to happen with interest rates, and you need these deep financial markets that can say to you things like, you can buy something that says that if you sell these vehicles to, a certain, to another country, uh, you want to make sure that you're getting, the exchange rate will be such that you can make profit, you're not playing with the exchange rate, because that's not the business that GM is in, is, is worrying about exchange rates. So they pay a service charge to somebody else who says, I will guarantee you that exchange rate. And that other party then sells, uh, plays in the exchange rate market to cover their risks. So again, if you have a deep financial market, you can do those things. And you can deal with uncertainties about interest rates and about inflation and even about political instability and the possibility of closure. You can even, uh, uh, bankruptcy, you can even bet on whether a company is going to close or not and get some insurance against that if you're an investor, then you're more likely to invest. In other words, in this incredibly complex world, it's an incredible thing to imagine how you actually run a global economy, which is full of different nations, different nation states, different exchange rates, and finance is playing a role in overcoming the risks in doing that. Now, it created all kinds of new risks and uncertainty, but it was functional to business. And it was also functional to business on a daily basis in terms of what's called arbitrage. Corporations sit there every day with all kinds of money, and the next day they may need to borrow money from somebody so that they can pay their wages, and today they're getting the revenue. So on a daily basis, corporations would look on the computer or, or go and basically say, we'll invest our money overnight, wherever it's highest in the world, and then when we have to borrow money, we'll borrow it from wherever it's cheapest in the world. So corporations are also involved in, in the market that way. So the first point I want to emphasize is this isn't finance versus industry. This is about the capitalist class and finance have become important and functional. I'm sorry. I'm going to thank you, Herman, and I apologize to the translator who's probably lying on the floor. But, okay. Uh, so, so, so my first point was that uh, we have to think about this in terms of class interests and specific interests. Business has a class interest in the power of finance, disciplines workers, and has a class interest because it understands that the kind of restructuring that finance enforces ends up strengthening the class. We always have to remember that when there's a lot of competition and some firms go bankrupt, the ones that are left are stronger. Whereas for the working class, it's exactly the opposite. When you have competition, you end up fragmenting each other and becoming worse. So intensified competition ends up strengthening the class. Then there are the specific interests of business, which I mentioned before, in terms of finance servicing business. Uh, then there's the fact that workers as consumers have an interest in finance. It's given them cheap credit. They're very interested in this. It's given them some security in a very individual way. And I want to get back to that, because this is very important in terms of class formation. The workers have supported uh, whatever resistance there may have been at some point in time, they came to accept this. Uh, that, and, and now they're dependent on, on finance. Uh, as you see with the bank bailout, the first response to the bank bailouts in the United States was people protesting this, you know, the, 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 the letters to Congress or something like 800 to 1 against the bank bailout because people resent giving money to the rich, obviously, and especially to banks who they see as parasites. But if you waited three or four days, you suddenly found out that this was reversed. People began to figure out that their pension fund and their house mortgages, and even whether they're going to be able to withdraw money from the bank the next day, all, all of this they're actually dependent on. So workers have, be, have, have become to have some benefits from cheap finance, but also become dependent on it. Then there's the role of the American Empire. The American Empire, because of this depth, uh, financial markets, it meant two things. One is it meant that markets were actually a way of spreading capitalism and the American presence in capitalism globally, as these markets penetrated everywhere, Asia, Eastern Europe, Latin America. 
But B, it was a way of the U.S. actually getting access to global funds, to the global surplus. Instead of a small village in Asia uh, putting funds in a local co-op or something, it became attractive to put it into the urban financial center where you could get a higher return. And that urban financial center might invest it in the United States. So in that way, the U.S. actually got access to global savings. And this reinforced its ability to play this role of empire. It meant that the United States was the home of consumption, of people placed where you could export to. It also meant that the U.S. was managing the global financial system that everybody depended on. And the Federal Bank of the United States actually became almost the world central bank. So there was an interest in the American empire. And then there was even an interest in all this finance, financialization from the third world. And that was for a number of reasons. One of the things that happened in the 1997 crisis was Europe had gotten all this money, Asia, I'm sorry, had gotten all this money flowing into Asia. This was also true in places like Brazil and Russia. But then they found out that at least very, when something goes wrong, they can also leave very quickly. So they began to build up their reserves so they'd be more secure. They, they tried to have a surplus in trade, which they could have because the U.S. was consuming so much, and then they would take those dollars and hang on to them in case of an emergency. And that serves two purposes. One, it could say, don't worry about our currency falling and leaving the country because you're worried that our, our currency might fall. We've got all these dollars to put into the market to keep our currency up if we need to. And second of all, it actually, uh, instead of their currency rising, uh, which, which they were all worried about because they wanted the export competitive, they were buying all this dollar and selling their currencies so that uh, their currency would be protected. Now, the details aren't so important, but what I'm trying to emphasize is they too were interested in the system and dependent on the system of holding U.S. dollars and, and, and accepting the role of finance rather than challenging it, learning to live with it. So, so the point I'm trying to say just as a beginning is we cannot just think of finance as something as speculative. You may think about that normally or parasitical, but when you ask about the role of finance from the perspective of how capitalism works, finance was functional. Okay. Now, how does this all relate to the crisis? And uh, I'll try to briefly relate this to how we can understand the centrality of finance. <coughs> the argument that I want to make, and this is based on work that I'm doing with my comrade uh, Leo Panch, is that finance has gotten so strong and it plays such an important role in the economy that in other periods the crisis you know, was occurring in profitability crises in the non-financial sector, profit squeeze, might have been over accumulation in a particular period. In this particular moment, the crisis has to be understood, first of all, as a crisis in finance. And there's three things that have happened in finance. And when we talk about financialization, I think we're talking about three things. One is there's been a commodification of finance. And what I mean by that is, in an earlier period, a lot of loans was about a relationship between somebody who was borrowing money from the bank. You went to the bank and took out a loan, you got some credit. It was true of business, that was true of <coughs> consumers. Now what's happened is that that loan has itself become a commodity. In other words, there's an IOU, and now you sell that IOU. Somebody else buys that IOU, and the bank is taken out of the banking system. That IOU can be sold again, or somebody can wrap up 100 IOUs and sell them to somebody else. So now there's a whole market for IOUs. So now there's become this commodification of credit, which is part of why it can grow so rapidly and deepen, and why now somebody from China who doesn't have a clue of who you are might own your IOU. The second thing about finance is the penetration of finance. When we talk about financialization, it's it, what we're referring to is how finance, and this is part of capitalism's finance, of direct penetration, is how finance has penetrated every dimension of our lives and, dimension, and penetrated the spatial. So it's penetrated globally when we talk about globalization, but alongside globalization has always been changes at home. Globalization does not just happen out there. It's always about changes at home to facilitate it, and the penetration of finance has been here. That's culturally and everything I was saying earlier about uh, the working class finances now in, 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 in industry and it's in consumer. So it's a question of financialization, and I've lost track of where I was. And the third element of, of the finance is autonomy. 
And again, this is because finance has now developed to such an extent, it is so deep and strong that it has a degree of its own autonomy. You can now talk about things happening within finance in terms of competition, in terms of innovation, in terms of technology. A lot of this couldn't happen if you didn't have computerization, for example. And a lot of the early developments in the use of computers was actually happening in the financial sector. So there's, a, uh, there's an autonomy to finance. And one of the things that's happening within finance is there's an enormous competition within finance. Uh, you know, in industry, you've got, you know, if you've got an advantage, you can make a specific vehicle, you've got engineering capability. What, what's the advantage of finance so that somebody can't just copy what you're doing and so that you're going to make a high rate of return? Why isn't all this finance mean that they're all competing with each other and lowering the, the, the price of uh, uh, credits so that nobody's making a profit? Well, everyone is trying to figure out how to compete and how to innovate with enormous competition. And I say innovation in their terms. <coughs> Uh, and part of this means that the way you compete is you keep extending the boundaries of risk. You keep figuring out how to do things that seemed impossible to do before because they were so risky. And now you're going to figure out how to make that possible. And that's how you're going to make your money. You're going to do it in that way. And that's crucial. Uh, okay. The second element of this crisis, so on the one hand there is these developments of, see, in finance, and this has to be related to how finance intersected with housing. Uh, as, content, as finance was competing with each other and trying to find new arenas for credit, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they were providing services to business, to non-financial business, but non-financial business wasn't that interested in just getting credit because they had all, all the money that they needed. Their profitability was high. The success of capitalism in their terms meant that they had all the money they needed, workers didn't. So workers were a space that they were really looking to. Uh, and, and Marxists haven't generally analyzed this very much. Marxists analyze finance in terms of the money that's lent to, uh, to business. But integrating the working class into this is a very important dimension of this. And uh, uh, the other thing, and housing becomes so critical to this because on the one hand, housing is risky. You're always worried about whether people are going to pay their mortgages. But on the other hand, housing has two advantages. One is that there's collateral. People don't pay. You can take your home. The second thing is that housing prices don't seem to fall. <coughs> didn't seem to fall. Uh, so it seemed like a sure bet. Worst that happens, you take over somebody's home and the price has gone up, so you won. That's even a sure bet for the people who are buying the mortgage. You can offer them a mortgage with uh, no down payment, no interest rate. Maybe the interest will start in two or three years. And even that person can think in terms of, well, maybe if housing prices are going to go up, even if I uh, decide to walk away from it, I'll actually have more equity. So, you, so the question is, well, how are you going to do this now? How are you going to deal with this? On the one hand, you've got the security of collateral and housing prices going up, but still risky. So, they be, so, so one thing they began to do is to get more and more leverage. There's a part of the financial system that's regulated. By regulation, I mean that for every dollar you have, you can maybe lend eight dollars. And they found ways of getting around this by creating new kinds of institutions, which you don't have to know about, you know, security, uh, securitized investment deals, there's all these fancy things. But it was a way of getting around this, and a way of doing this to investment banks, which aren't regulated in the same way. And basically what it meant was that people would start doing things like leveraging $40 a month. That's how we'll make the money. We may get a little greater return on it. But we'll, we'll, we'll expand the market dramatically. We'll take one dollar that we can borrow from someplace, and we'll lend forty dollars. So what if we get a very small risk return? We'll make a fortune. That's one thing they did. And the other thing they did is they're figuring out how to be innovative on this. They just keep uh, distributing the risk in a way that either shared the risk or passed it on. So you'd have somebody, for example, who would go and get a, uh, offer somebody a mortgage. But they would take that mortgage and they'd sell it to the bank. Uh, that way they didn't have to worry about whether the person pays or not. They got a fee for arranging it. The bank would say, we'll keep some of them, but most of them we don't really want. So we'll sell them to somebody else. And then they'd get fancy. They'd take some of these subprime mortgages, which are basically mortgages for poorer people, uh, and we'll combine them with other mortgages that are obviously secure. And we'll combine the whole package and we'll sell that. 
And then the other person sells that. So you ended up with sharing the risk. People didn't even know what they were buying anymore, but things seemed to be working, so you do it. So you have that. I should have emphasized that. Maybe I didn't make this clear enough. The point I wanted to make about finance being functional was that even though people knew that at some point this kind of constant development of finance is going to come to some end, nobody wanted to prick the bubble because everyone's benefiting. And everyone, I, I include the working class. This is part of what happens. And not only do they benefiting from it, they're seeing that it works. So you know, so you go into an investment dealer. All investment dealers have a department that's called the risk department. And the risk department would say, uh, we shouldn't do this. It's just too risky. I did the mathematics, I did the calculations, this doesn't work. And they would say, wait a second, we told us that last time. And it was fine, so where's your credibility? Or they, somebody would come in from uh, with another plan and they'd say, we've got a plan here, and if you do this plan, we'll make $100 million. And the, the risk department would say, well, we don't really think you should do this. And the guy would say, well, fine, we'll go to somebody else. And then they had the company would say, well, wait a second, maybe we should do it. You know, maybe it's not going to, you know, things won't happen. Well, so, you know, the system keeps going. Right. So let me get back to, to the argument on what's happening there. So, so you have, on the one hand, uh, you know, especially in the United States, homes are seen as an American birthright. And they're also seen as a way of getting stability. It's not an accident that a lot of the support for homes was in poor black neighborhoods. Because there was a lot of mobilization in black neighborhoods going back to the 70s about having your own home, about having the right to a home like everybody else. And it was seen as if you give people their home, There'll be more stability, especially after, you know, after the black riots in the 60s. So there was a lot of mobilization from below to extend homes. And since nobody was talking about public housing, that's off the agenda. The only way you could do this was through the market. So there was pressure from below even to do this and get the banks more involved in this collateral. And you really had support from the state. And again, this is very important in understanding neoliberalism. You've got private market housing, but the state is completely involved. You know, on the one hand, uh, you know, this cultural point that I made, I gave a quote from uh, Levitt, which I don't have in front of me, but it's basically, Levitt was the guy who after the war set up, began to make mass housing in the United States, basically industrialized housing. And he developed these first suburban housing uh, developments, which then became related to how the car development, how cities developed, etc. And uh, his, his, one of the slogans was, uh, no man who owns a house and a lot can be a communist. I mean, it was a, it was a conscious, and it was supported by the government on that basis. Uh, but it, but it's, it's, it's more than that. In the United States, there are tax credits on the payments you make for your mortgages. And that encourages people to borrow as opposed to just rent. You get a tax credit on your mortgage as opposed to being a renter. Uh, they set up Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which, which were called private institutions, but everybody knew they were backed by the state. And they actually bought a lot of these mortgages. They didn't so much deal with it in the subprime mortgages, but they bought a lot of the mortgages that people were buying and selling, so that gave, gave people confidence to do it. And that's always important to finance, that you've got security of those kinds of property guarantees. And one of the big things they did was they lowered standards. And a lot of progressives supported this. They said, well, make it easier for people to borrow homes. And a lot of progressives saw this and said, yeah, this is fair and equal people will get homes. So, so you get the development of housing becomes a critical uh, part of the financial market. And this especially takes off after about 97. In the, first, in the 100 years before 97, housing rose a little bit above inflation. I remember it might have been 18% above the rate of inflation. Housing always went up, but it kind of matched inflation. Uh, from 97 to 2005, to early 2006, it went up 85%. So again, it was clear that this wasn't unsustainable. Something crazy was, was going on. Okay, so this ends as a habit. Around 2005, 2006, you end up with prices peaking. And once prices peak, everything unravels. Because now, if you're not sure, you know, prices are falling, then everybody begins to worry about uh, if people can't pay their mortgages, and I'm going to get this asset that isn't worth as much, and I might be in trouble. And at the same time, they had lowered, I forgot to mention this, they had lowered interest rates 
in around 2001 to 2004 uh, in order to encourage more credit, especially in homes, because the tech bomb, tech dot, tech dot bubble, tech com bubble, <laughs> had ended. What's the phrase? Dot com, dot com. I'm sorry, folks. Dot com bubble had ended. Uh, they, they were worried about the things in Rally. They wanted things to keep going. They lowered interest rates. But by 2000, so interest rates had been low, but by 2004, they're starting to worry a little bit about inflation, they raised interest rates. So what happens is, the people who had bought their homes at zero interest rate, the two years are up now, so they've got to now start paying and they can't afford it. So housing prices are falling, people aren't uh, able to pay their mortgages, so there's more homes coming on the market, so that's reinforcing the housing thing crashing. People can't refinance, which is the other alternative, forget about the mortgage you've got, just go refinance it. Because mortgage rates have just gone up because interest rates went up, so we can't do that. So you start having this unravel uh, in the housing market, construction. So, uh, so two things are happening simultaneously that are crucial. On the one hand, this really affects the whole credit market. Uh, now businesses are finding that uh, all these mortgages they have might be worthless. So now banks who are holding them are afraid to lend money to anybody else. They don't know whether they'll get paid back because they might be in trouble. And they're also worried about their own assets, the things that they're holding. What if they're worthless? So maybe they should call back some other loans so that they have some cash on hand. So they call back loans. And soon everybody's afraid to lend to each other because now it's full of uncertainty. Finance is so dependent on that kind of security. So you begin to have, have an unraveling in the financial sector. And the other thing that happens is that housing is different than the stock market. If you just have a crash in the stock market, so rich people are hurt often temporarily, but wait it out until stocks go back up. But when you have a housing crash, it begins to affect the mass of people. Everybody's worried about what's happening to their, their housing price and whether they're, it's going to affect them because they thought at some point a seller home and move into a condominium and don't have money for retirement. And therefore, they have to say, well, now I have to start saving. They have to delete, delete they're investors now. So they don't have to say, I'm going to stop spending if I start saving for my retirement. Construction stops. Home furnishing stops. Buying appliances stops. So you start having this problem in the real economy. And these two things begin affecting each other. The insecurity in the financial market, and they're not lending, means that people can't get loans for cars. It means that small businesses and suppliers don't have money. Uh, and as the economy freezes, even corporations are making money before now don't have money, so they want to start borrowing. And nobody is lending or borrowing, so now we have an impact on the real economy, reinforced by the fact that the housing thing is part of the real economy. It isn't just money. So you have this complete uh, breakdown. Um, and it's global, because everybody is in this. All financial markets, you know, some of the largest investors in American housing have been uh, uh, China and uh, German investors. Uh, okay, now I want to get to the question of, so, so what does this all mean? Uh, if we understand it in this way, if we understand it in terms of, it's not about capital itself being strong and just fixing a weak capitalism and then we can go on as usual. It's not about the end of the American empire. Uh, it's not about the end of neoliberalism. What do we do? And we're going to be attacked. I mean, this, is going to, this is a deep crisis. There are going to be all these questions about who pays for this and just how capital trust itself tries to survive and how it does So there's obviously this question of self-defense. That's a crucial part of, of what has to happen. But we can't just see this as self-defense. We have to think about how do we both defend ourselves and build the capacity so that we can actually change things. Because when you just try to Defend yourself, you always find out that, that well, there's limited options in what you can do. The company comes to you and says, well, we'll either close, or we'll threaten to close, or we'll lay off back the workforce, or you give up a benefit, or you give up your wages. And given those choices, you know, not much of a choice. If you want to change things, you have to expand what the choices are going to be in the future. And that actually means we have to do the kind of radical thinking about how do we actually build our capacity so we can match what we're up against and start changing things. At the same time, the defense has to be part of it. And I think that's how we have to think about this. Um, 
I, I start with I start with the practice of, of, of defense because if there is no resistance, nothing happens. If there isn't resistance, then there's nothing on the agenda. Uh, you know, one of the frightening things so far is that how little resistance has been. You know, in the states, in terms of millions of people losing their homes, in terms of closures, in terms of tapping the auto industry. But you know, no one's saying, well, why are we letting them close up? Why are we take over the plant? Why are we take over the home? Uh, and I don't quite understand it, in spite of the fact that I think this reflects how defeated we've been uh, in terms of how we respond and how, you know, this is the real success of capitalism, how defeated we've been. Uh, but the other thing we should also remember is that, uh, and I think also, I mentioned this last night too, I think the United States, part of this was Obama's campaign. I think there was a real concern in the black community, among black leaders, that if there was a lot of turmoil in the black community beating up the election, it might actually hurt Obama. And I think there was a lid put on this when it first happened, because that's when people are most likely to resist. Uh, that might be part of it. But what we should also remember was that the resistance didn't immediately come in the Great Depression either. From 29 to 33, even into 34, there was very little resistance. People were just numb. They were like just in shock. They were either waiting for it to happen or didn't know what to do. And it took a long time for something to happen. And it did happen, sometimes it was spontaneous, but it only meant something substantial, substantial when it got away. And I'll, I'll be that. So the first point I really want to emphasize is that uh, we need to think about resistance uh, and uh, you know, in all kinds of ways. I mean, there's going to be all kinds of things they're going to do. Uh, you know, right, I don't, for example, I don't think they're going to be cutting welfare rates, you just can't do that. And they don't have the credibility to do that because neoliberalism has lost a lot of ideological credit. And you're heading into the largest depression, the largest collapse crisis since the Great Depression. It's going to be very hard to kind of announce what you're going to attack the poor when you should be attacking the rich. But what they will do is they're going to start an industry of welfare and poverty programs much more difficult. So they don't change legislation and make it political, but do it in practice. And that's already happened in both Toronto and Ontario. There's going to be things happening. There's going to be pressure on public sector workers to give up money on the basis of uh, sharing the, the poverty or we need the money for social programs. Uh, one of the things that I think should happen is that where there are layoffs, I think one of the things the labor movement should think about, which it hasn't thought about for half a century, uh, this is controversial, is I think it should think about arguing to share the layoffs. Uh, in, in, the, in the 30s and 40s, when union industrial unions were formed, they had in their contract that before anybody was laid off, you would go to a four-day work week, for example. So instead of laying off workers, instead of laying off 25% of the workforce, 20% of the workforce, everybody was worth 20% less. And it was a gesture of solidarity. It was an understanding that we're in a moment of building. And if you want to build, this is what you have to do. It's a sacrifice, but you have to do it. And that got replaced by seniority. So now what happens is you lay off the youngest workers, and that's what young workers end up learning about the union. It doesn't matter if the union wasn't there for that. And it's a devastating lesson in terms of uh, building and in terms of uh, you know, what people carry with them when they go someplace else. And I think it's something for workers to really think about. And I think they should add to it the demand that, uh, for example, if you're going to 32-hour week, that you get 36 hours a day. I don't think you can argue for 40 hours a day. Uh, I think there is an argument that you should make some sacrifice. But if they're throwing around all this money in the name of job creation, why shouldn't this count? Why shouldn't there be this kind of subsidy on the basis of, well, people would be paid unemployment insurance anyways. Why not keep the workforce together and do this? And that way you're making it a political demand in addition to a world-class demand. Uh, and I'll, 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 let, let me just emphasize something about the work time demand. I was going to get to it later, but I might as well just emphasize it now. I think the question of work time is one of the most important demands that there is, and it's completely off the agenda. And the reason that I think it's so important is that if we really think that people are going to become active in changing their lives, they need space to do this. They need time to relax, and they need time to read, and they need time to participate. And that's not possible anymore. With two people working full time, in a lot of jobs, a lot of workers working extra hours, it's not possible. You're just too exhausted. It's too much to expect from people. 
people might actually go to some meetings once in a while, they might be active, but they can't sustain it. And I, I think that's enormously important. They used to do this by exploiting their wives. The wives will take care of all the chores and they'll go to the meeting. Well, that's not on anymore either. So there has to be a way of people having, uh, especially having well paid workers having uh, less time, uh, limits on overtime when there are layoffs, and it's also a question of flexibility. Uh, because a lot of people actually want more time working in precarious work. But I think this question of work time, if we're serious about organizing and resistance, and thinking that ordinary people are going to be part of it, and are actually going to develop their capacities and become human beings, they need the space and freedom away from work. Uh, I think that's fundamental. Okay. So the first thing I want to emphasize is this need for resistance. And then, and then I want to raise some larger demands. And I just want to say at the beginning, because some of this came up last night, I'm not presenting demands here that I think are innovative. I'm not raising things that I, I think haven't been raised before, by the way. I'm raising things because I think the times are different in the way that we need to take them seriously uh, in a new way. And I also think that it's important how we articulate the demands. Like I said, I think the same demand uh, could have different meanings depending on how it's articulated. So, so the first thing I want to raise is demands that go beyond the defense. Now, resistance is crucial, it's a starting point, it's a precondition. But if you stay defensive, you can't sustain it. It just means you slow down, getting killed later. So there has to be a sense of larger demands that build collective capacities, that actually build alliances around which we can build. And I think a crucial point about thinking about this is what kind of demands build solidarity? Because one of the things that has happened to neoliberalism isn't just that the rich became rich relative to the rest of us, but there's been a real polarization within the working class. There's been a real growth of inequality within the working class, and that's a barrier to solidarity. It means that, uh, and that's a barrier. Put up your hand when I'm speaking too fast and I'll slow down. So we have to think about demands that actually address equality. Because a lot of what's happened is. Workers have tended to privatize the welfare state. The most organized sections of the working class have one thing, decent benefits for themselves. Uh, that was great when it was a model for then socializing for everybody. But then it ends up actually fragmenting the class. You can hang on to them in good times, but in bad times, you lose them because you have the female side. In the United States, the real tragedy was around health care. A lot of workers got health care. Uh, the fight they should have had when the company told them you have to give it up should have been, no, we'll go on strike for it. We'll actually represent everybody because we think we should have a national health care. I think they could have rebuilt the American trade union movement on it. But instead, they ended up giving it up to save jobs. So I think we have to think about demands that build solidarity. And the other thing we have to think about is demands that create some independence for us relative to the market and employers. So for example, if we're dependent on the stock market for our pensions, that becomes a problem because we're locked into thinking a particular way about well, what's good for the stock market. You know, you, you end up with workers cheering when the stock market goes up. Uh, even the reason, if the reason that the stock market goes up is because the corporations involved are restructured more and laying off people, so the stock market goes up. Yeah, workers cheering when housing prices rise, which means that other people are going to have trouble getting into the housing market. So we have to somehow deal with things that create that kind of independence. Again, in the United States, uh, you know, the situation of healthcare is desperate. People are afraid of losing their health care, so they give up things to, to hang on to it. Or they give up things because they see it as making their corporation competitive. So you end up with a loyalty to the company rather than a loyalty to the class. So tactically, we have to think in terms of what kind of demands increase solidarity and equality? What kind of demands increase our independence? And that's where the social programs are so important. I mean, there are things we've always had on the agenda. And you know, so, so we have to emphasize them again for that reason. When we argue for improving welfare rates and unemployment insurance, we're now starting to talk about it for everybody. And we start recognizing that people who thought they were immune from this are going to be affected by this. And even workers who aren't losing their jobs are now finding that their spouse or their kids or a relative or a friend is going to need this. If you think about the family, everybody's going to depend on it. It's why so, you know, not only, and we should be more aggressive about it. We shouldn't just be talking about the pending object. We should talk about now we need to extend it. We don't want to just depend on the employer for a dental plant or a farmer care plant. 
We want to extend healthcare. So we should have a whole series of programs around pensions for everybody that are adequate. The, the, the next stage is going to be this attack on pension funds, which has already happened. You know, the latest thing has been that to change the laws for the corporations who used to have to put so much money in, so the fund will be there when we close. They're giving them, you know, an extra five years or ten years holidays. Well, what does that mean? That when it comes time to pay for this, they'll say, well, we can't afford it now, otherwise we'll be in real trouble, or they already go bankrupt in the meantime and they're stuck. So we have to talk about all the social programs. Basically, we want to commodify them. Basically, we want to make them rights. So we're changing the culture, that there are things you get not through the marketplace, that you're not dependent on, and that there are solidaristic things, so therefore we can fight for them together. I think that's one thing that we have to really uh, raise. Uh, the other point I want to, uh, two, two points I want to make about this. Uh, the other is, uh, I, I think on this whole question of infrastructure, we also have to think about the fact that there's different kinds of infrastructure. There's infrastructure that they'll do that uh, might be partially helpful to us, or might just be about strengthening the ability of capital to, to uh, accumulate. We have to really think about, well, what kind of infrastructure? If they're going to spend all this money on infrastructure, what do we want? Do, do we want to spend on the environment? Do we want it to spend on public housing? Do we want to spend on restructuring our cities? Do we want to spend on social infrastructure as part of it? On child care? On services for the aged? On more cultural centers? On more sports centers? Uh, <coughs> services? You know, what kind of society do we want? So it's not just, yay, they're spending on infrastructure and that's great because the government's involved. We've got to get over that and actually ask the class questions about this. So I, I think, again, there, there's a whole set of demands that we can start thinking about formulating and formulating the way that people are learning from how we structure these demands. And, and as we struggle around them, we're learning things. We're learning that we want an alternative culture and to think differently. And the reason that I think that this is so important is because we have to realize what has happened to class formation uh, in, in terms of worker survival over the last 25 years. Workers aren't actually passive. They always figure out how to survive. So how do they survive? They work longer hours. A lot of this has been wise who were starting to get into the workforce in the early 80s, now working full time. They go into debt. They, they go for a tax cut because a tax cut is like a wage increase. The point about all those kinds of demands are that they, they're individual demands. They're an attempt to solve problems individually. You know, it means that you know, uh, we ask an auto worker to come to a demonstration against tuition fee increases, and he says, I've been there, done that, it doesn't seem to change anything, the week is so left, who cares? I'll work, I'll work an extra week or two, and that'll solve the problem. So he solves the problem for himself, other people who can't solve it that way don't have that option, and when you raise them again, he's running out of vacation time to even work. So, but what people have done that individually, and what it means when you do it individually is you lose the sense of, co of collective struggle. When you used to be on the picket line to increase your income, there were things that happened. On the picket line, you actually talk to other workers, you find out what you have in common. Uh, you, you, know, you, you might barely speak the same language, but you find out you're on the picket line. There's a whole difference. Bob White used to say that people on the picket line, everybody becomes a philosopher or on the picket line. Uh, they're away from the workplace, they're kind of bored, they talk about everything. They talk about personal stuff, they talk about what it's life. What did you want to do before you got stuck on this job? Um, and you know, that, that's, that's part of change. So there's collective struggle. And I was actually shocked at people saying it's because they vote for us. The unionized workers. And the reason they raised that was either because they had a family member who was affected, but most of all, they didn't like what I was doing to their community. They didn't want a community that was actually attacking the poor and what that meant. And as they did this, they actually began to feel proud of the fact that they stood up for the poor. They began to change them too. So there's a real difference when you struggle collectively versus when you try to survive individually. In a sense, when you survive individually, you reinforce the other rules. You reinforce that way. You're integrated. You're part of it. And what happens over time is you forget how to struggle collectively. You forget how to organize a campaign or how to organize a, a work stoppage. So, so, so that's the importance of those kinds of demands and getting our heads out of just uh, uh, responding individually. And the, the last thing I just want to make about this point is that it isn't just workers who have been integrated into the other One of the things we have to really worry about is that our unions 
as institutions, as part of the fact that their collective organizations have been integrated, because they haven't acted in a class way. They've acted in a particular way. They've acted on behalf of their members. So unions end up, uh, you know, to be very worried about competitiveness. And in order to be worried about competitiveness, they end up identifying with what well, we have to make our own employers strong. So the ally becomes their employer, not the rest of the working class. And if you end up with those kinds of solutions, again, you're fragmenting the class. And the unions become part of it, rather than the unions seeing competitiveness as a constraint. Yeah, this capitalism is real, we have to deal with it. But how do we stretch that constraint? How do we create an environment where that constraint isn't as binding? That's what the issue is. And it also ends up with a lot of NGOs. NGOs are generally, all the NGO people I know are progressive people who are trying to do something positive and helpful, but they've been trapped into the fact that they're doing things which the state used to do. Now the state does cheaper by passing it on to NGOs, and it controls their funding. And it doesn't just control how much money they get, it now controls them on the basis of each project. So if they don't like the project because it's too radical, or because the last project was too radical, the funding gets cut off. So they end up self-censoring themselves. And we have to also figure out how do we deal with this, can the left have a relationship to NGOs because they have all the contacts in the communities where they can give us contacts if we want to organize and mobilize, where we can maybe be the fronts because they can still bring people to demos but they can't leave. Okay, so that's one kind of a question. How do we put national demands on the agenda that have this kind of cultural, egalitarian, solidaristic, decommodification uh, notion with, with a strong class base, from a class perspective? Overall class. When I say class, I just want to emphasize, I mean that broad unionized, non-unionized, employed, unemployed. I include people in poverty, and I include people with disabilities who can't get into the life of I'm talking about people who basically can't live off their capital. Okay. Now, even if we raise all of this, we have to raise the question of power. We have to raise the question of corporations having power. You cannot have a democratic society if you have power distributed on equal. Democracy is not about a form of government so you can elect somebody to administer the economy. <laughs> democracy is about a form of society. And we have to start talking about democracy and getting democracy on the agenda. And talking about democracy means challenging the private power of power. Uh, and, you know, if we don't do this, we're not serious. I just want to emphasize this. I mean, it's not just that I think that democracy is an important thing. But if we don't do this, we're not serious, because then you end up with all the world problems. Well, we've got to be competitive so we can afford social problems. We've got to grow so we can afford this. You can't grow unless you cater to the corporations, because they're the ones that invest. If we're not taking that on somehow, it's difficult. But if we're not actually sitting around saying, we've got to think about this, and this is the time to think about it right now, then I think we're not uh, serious. And I just want to give a couple of examples uh, of where we have to think about this. One place is in art. Some people have talked about uh, nationalizing General Motors. One of the reasons is you could probably buy General Motors for $5. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm kind of, sorry. Uh, okay, so I, I was just saying that, well, you know, some people have talked about nationalizing General Motors. Uh, I'm not enamored with that kind of demand, because I think one of the things that ends up with is, first of all, you're buying the weakest companies. Why, why is that how we should kind of define Socialism, in a sense, that you know, it's kind of lemon socialism. You buy the things that don't work. Uh, the other thing is, if you end up with all you're going to have to do is compete with Toyota, then you're going to say, well, this is our factory right now, but we're going to come like Toyota to compete with us. And because it's going to take a while for workers to develop capacities, anyways, uh, that's going to be disastrous. Uh, so I, I think this idea of just kind of—I would rather talk about it in a different way. And the way that I would prefer to talk about it is that if you actually look at what's happening in the auto industry, the real tragedy is that workers aren't actually, the unions aren't talking about the workers who are being laid off. They're just representing the members who are still working. And the problem is, is that there's now more laid off workers than there's workers working. Uh, you know, in the big three, they've gone over the last, since 2000, well, after the last decade, from about half a million to under a quarter of a in the big three. In the parts industry, uh, you know, probably another 350,000 jobs that have 
And what all of this means isn't just these workers who are losing jobs. It's devastating communities on the one hand. So I'm going to talk about the community, not just the company. And the other thing is that there's all this productive capacity that we're letting go. At a time when everyone's talking about, or we need a productive capacity to do things, why are we letting tool and die shops, component plants that can make anything go? Now what that means is we should stop thinking about just the companies, but we should be thinking about productive capacity. Now we should stop thinking just about sectors, but we should be thinking about community. So for example, why don't we talk about establishing a crown corporation? We have a struggle with making sure it's democratic, but talking about a crown corporation that will take over all these crowns, that the corporations aren't interested in and soon will just let take off the plant and equipment and sell it off in the third world or destroy it. And saying we want it. We want this to create jobs. If you're talking about creating jobs with all this infrastructure, why aren't you creating jobs with these plants already? Why aren't you doing something there? Now what that would mean is that you would need a plan. Well, what are you going to make? Same thing in the community. Why do we, you know, Windsor as an example, had a crisis before the crisis started. Had the highest unemployment rate in Canada, and no one was talking about the crisis in Windsor. I mean, what it would mean in Windsor is why aren't we saying, we've got all these skilled workers, and by the way, nobody can leave Windsor, because nobody can sell their home. <laughs> so they can't leave. So why aren't we saying, we've got all these skilled workers, we've got all this plant equipment, why don't we convert that? In Windsor, there's, I don't know, <laughs> hundreds of programs, somebody's actually been sending you a list on Monday, of what the city has been waiting to do if they had some money. Of infrastructure. Public infrastructure, social infrastructure, doing it. Why don't we do that? Why don't we develop a plan for Windsor and make it into a democratic plan? Actually get the community involved in planning what kind of a city we want. Why not make Windsor into an example? Especially when we're talking about infrastructure and all the stimulus. Why not do it now? Now, to do these kind of, okay. Now, one of the things that you could do with this is link to what Torche said about the environment. Uh, if we're serious about the environment, what it means is not just that we need small cars, and it doesn't even just mean that we need more public transit, which we do, but it means changing everything. What the environment means is that everything in the future is going to be changed. Everything about us. How we produce things inside a factory, factories are going to look differently. The engines and the motors in factories are going to be different. The tooling is going to be different. Everything about what we consume, everything about how we travel, everything about how we live, because we can't change transportation and everything else without thinking about changing cities, everything about the infrastructure, everything about, you know, the need for retrofitting, for solar panels, for wind turbines. There is an enormous potential if we're serious. Why aren't we doing that? So that's one thing. You can do it at the community level, you can do it at that level. What it means is you're talking about planning. Planning hasn't been on the agenda, so we end up with competition. If you talk about planning, then you're saying our jobs don't depend on them again. It doesn't depend on driving general motors. It doesn't depend on variety capital in general by saying, look, we'll, we'll, we'll have a nice climate for you. We'll keep your taxes low. We'll have the social programs. Don't worry about it. We'll keep labor contained. It means we're actually talking about planning. In a sense, it's a difficult process. How do you actually make it democratic? And not but those are the kind of things we have to learn if we're serious. So that's on the auto. Another obvious thing is oil, especially since we know oil is going to go up again. Oil is linked to the environment. How do we deal with the environmental impacts of oil? Uh, you know, I think it's a mistake, for example. You know, there's a lot of populist campaigns around lowering the price of oil. I don't think that's the issue. The price of oil here is very is relatively low by uh, comparisons internationally. The question is, why are we using the surplus in a productive way? And that raises the question of oil. But if you raise the question of oil, again, you have to understand how radical it is, not just to take them on. Because you have to say, well, what are we doing with it? Because what our oil is integrated not into is the American Empire. And that's one of the questions we're going to have to deal with. Sorry. One of the questions we're going to have to deal with in whatever we do at some point is that it comes up against the American Empire and our integration into it. We are dependent and integrated into the U.S. Empire, so we have to also deal with how do we deal with it. Uh, what happens if we oppose the war? And we say, we're not willing to just keep sending you oil in order to finance uh, a war. So that's another issue we have to deal with. And that does raise questions about whether at some point there isn't also resistance in the United States. We're not going to be able to change the world just in Canada. But you have to start uh, wherever you are. The other example I want to 
raise the question of the banks, also what Roger uh, raised. What we're actually seeing is that they have all declared to us, the state, everybody, all economists, every capitalist has declared that banks are public utility. The first priority in the economy is we have to save the banking system because everything depends on it. Well, we should take that seriously. If banks are a public utility, let's democratize it. And democratize it doesn't mean let's put a person on the board. Uh, so they can become bankers. Democratize it means we should actually talk about nationalizing the banks. And again, this is a very radical thing. We haven't even dared to talk about it before. But this is the moment where we have to think about radical things. Why don't we just get back to the same shit? And this is what we really have to be conscious of. If finance has become so important and we want to change things, then we have to think about taking on the banks. And the point of taking on the banks isn't so we can now administer a capitalist economy. You have to take on the banks so you can do something different with them. Otherwise, what was the point? Otherwise, you just demoralize everybody because they say, oh, not a bureaucracy. Uh, you take on the banks because you have some notion of the surplus in society, the overall social surplus, goes to the banks, to the financial system, and gets reallocated. That actually determines where investment goes, whether it goes into malls, whether it goes into other financial assets, whether it goes into building cities, whether it goes into planning, whether it goes around. What we're saying is we want to control that. We want to control it so we can have a democratic say in what kind of society we want and to start using it to actually democratize industry, to actually take on and start having some control over where, what investment is. Because investment affects everything. Investment affects everything about how our lives are structured and how our lives are structured. Work structure. So somehow or other, we have to get this on uh, the agenda. Uh, now, I, I want to emphasize something about all these points. I've been going from resistance to national kind of uh, larger, broader social programs and infrastructure programs, larger demands, to these kind of radical demands. These are not sequential. I'm not saying let's resist and then if out of that resistance something happens, let's build national, you know, national programs. And then if that's working, then maybe one day we'll raise the question of the banks. I'm saying we do this simultaneously. That the question of the banks has to be raised before it's possible, because otherwise it'll never be possible. It has to be on the agenda. It has to be part of how we talk about things. It has to be part of even what makes people confident in resisting, because they actually see something is being built. We're changing how people are talking about things. So that gives them confidence to do something. If you're talking about an auto plant, then maybe some workers will take over an auto factory and say, yeah, we don't want to lose this rather than waiting until they take it over. And then waiting until a lot of workers take it over and then coming up with this great idea. Why aren't we putting it on the agenda? So I, I really want to emphasize that, you know, that's how you make things possible. We, we put all of these things together. We try to build that kind of um, movement. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize about this is that as soon as you start talking about planning in some way, you have to start talking about your international relationships. You can't have free trade in plan. You can't say the corporations can do whatever they want in terms of investment and uh, leaving the country or capital, financial capital can do it for the trade uh, and have planning. Planning implies that you also plan the international economy. It doesn't mean that you cut off trade. You may be a whole different thing. You may want to get technology freely to other countries, third world countries, as a, as a gesture of solidarity so they can make things for their own market. But it does mean you start thinking more about inward development. Why do we have to keep exporting more all the time as a whole? Why can't we think about more collective, more inward development? Why can't we think about different countries kind of experimenting with more things developing? And not cutting off trade. And that also means, again, it's not that the free trade issue hasn't been on the agenda before, but it means we have to talk about it in a very specific way. To take on the question of free trade is not to say, we're opposed to free trade because we don't like Chinese workers. Or we're opposed to free trade because we want to save General Motors or the fast coast. That's not what it's about. What challenging free trade is about is challenging their freedom to do what they want in terms of our economy. Because that undermines our freedom. We're saying it's a question of democracy. That if we actually want to have a democratic society, we have to limit their freedom in order to have democracy for the majority of the population. Now we have to think about trade that way so it doesn't become a showing this thing.
Now, the neat thing about all of this is the question of organization. And what we have to recognize is that they're organized. That's what the state does. The state organizes it. Again, the state is part of capitalism. It's not something that threatens them. It organizes them. It tries to deal with their crisis. It tries to disorganize us. And for us to match that is an incredible thing. This is an amazing thing. We're talking about challenging these corporations that have this power and this knowledge. I always used to tell my corporations if they gave us the world tomorrow, we wouldn't know what to do with them. And this is, that's a serious point because capitalism doesn't let you develop the kind of skills so that you can plan. That's what capitalism does. You sell your labor, you sell your labor, your labor, they organize it, they coordinate technology, they have the links in terms of markets and internationally, so we become dependent on them. And so we have to kind of unlearn that dependence and learn to have confidence in our skills through struggles and through collective action. But organization is really profound. I really want to stress this. If you really think about what we're up against in terms of states and corporate power and everything that's happened to the working class and people generally under capitalism in terms of that dependence, we have to be serious about the fact that we don't just need spontaneity, we don't just need some loose links between each other, but we have to take seriously the question of how the hell are we going to organize ourselves? And it isn't just to organize ourselves so maybe we can win an election. Elections are important. But it's ultimately to organize ourselves so that we actually have the collective capacity and keep building it so we can take on everything that we're talking about. And I just want to say a few things about organization, and I'm going to end with that and we can get into the discussion. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, just to really emphasize this, the point is not alternative policies, it's alternative politics. We have to invent the kind of politics that can actually take on capitalism. And you know, in that sense, this is a generation that's going to have to be inventive and creative and, you know, represent some kind of historical turning point in the way the 30s did, which created the industrial working classes and other movements, but that was a movement that really emerged out of that, you know, it has to be comparable to the 60s and 70s, which began to challenge the culture of capitalism. Another question is, can we build uh, you know, another generational challenge to capitalism? And this means an alternative politics. Policies are important because they're part of mobilizing. Policies are important because they're part of building. But ultimately, what we have to keep coming back to is, how does it affect the question of our politics and building? Um, and the other thing I want to, you should not get into the trap of thinking that well, politics is about forming alliances. The trick to politics is we have to build unity between different unions and labor centrals, and we have to build unity between the movements in the centrals. This is obviously important. But there's two problems with this. One is unity over what? And the other is we have to recognize the flaws in each of these organizations. And that's very serious. That Unions have not changed. You know, in the 30s, they changed in terms of a particular crisis. They figured out that you can't just organize the skilled trades. That you had an egalitarian unionism that was industrially based. That was a transformation of what unions were. We haven't changed since then. Uh, and the question is, well, what kind of unions do you need to deal with this moment in time? And maybe it's a different kind of unionism. Maybe its energies have to be focused on Maybe it needs a different vision. And we have to really think of Think about it. So I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, unions are having trouble working. I think part of the reason is obviously it's hard. Granted, it's incredibly difficult. But I, I'm not convinced that if unions work harder at it, they'll work. It's one. I think it's about thinking about organizing differently. If you're organizing, for example, retail workers or poor workers, unions kind of try and, and often after a while they give up. It's too expensive, the dues you're going to get are too low, service them is too high. It doesn't happen. If instead you say, we have to organize them because we're building really the class. This isn't just whether we can get some members, but we have to build a class. Well, that's a different kind of commitment. That's a different kind of energy. That means that you might try to do different kinds of things. So, for example, you could in Windsor, for example, say, we're going to service all the food workers, fast food workers in Windsor. We're just going to tell them all, you have a problem, come to us. If it's about health and safety, which is one of the biggest problems in that. In, in, it's the worst, it's worse there than almost anywhere else in, in the fast food industry, whether it's about shifts, whether it's about management uh, of use. We're going to service you. 
free. Right? Give something voluntarily if you want. If you did that, over time you might get a concentration of either, hey, they're really strong in this location at this important. Maybe we can form a unit. Or even if you don't get anybody, they move on. They move on to another workplace and they remember you. That you actually try to represent them. They might contact you. Unions don't think this way. You need to think of them as service somebody who's not paying us. And then you can't organize them. The other problem is that you figure out ways of organizing that don't actually do anything. So the CAW says we want to organize badminton because they're the largest auto employer in the country, much bigger than General Motors. And the way we're going to organize them is that we're going to promise not to strike and not to have a shop site system. <laughs> so what do you build? You get dues. Uh, but it's not only that. It's not that you can build anything. Now, other employers say, why can't we have the same? He said, well, you can't have the same. Those are locked in. So they say, okay, we'll give us something else. Then you have the public sector who fought for the right to strike. The day that the, the CAW announced the medical agreement, there was a demonstration in Halifax of uh, healthcare workers for the right to strike in the healthcare sector. And other workers who had organized in the healthcare sector, they were part of the demonstration for the right to strike. And part of the response, obviously, for the government, what they were talking about, you just gave it out of the bank, you said it wasn't important. So, you know, it was incredibly devastating. And the same thing is happening with the SEIU in the United States. They're signing agreements with the employers that said, say that if you give us these and these units, we'll agree not to organize the other units. Then what they're doing is, in order to get new members, they're telling the members not to strike, because then it makes it harder to organize, because the employer's afraid of it. You employees not to be so afraid of it. And then they put all the money into organizing, but not service. So, you know, it's, it's about building uh, organizations. So we have to think about this in terms of unions have to be changed. Part of what has to change in unions is that within unions, there has to be a class perspective, because that affects your vision and your sense of what's possible. Now, I'm not saying that unions are going to become socialist organizations. They can't, because people don't join unions as socialists. And part of why we need organizations is because we need the kind of organizations that have feet in unions, feet to social movements, and work to bring them together to do whatever changes they can make in those organizations, to be affected by reality, by working in those organizations, but to build another organization that is built because unions can themselves do it. Um, and I think a lot of the same is true about social movements. Social movements do great stuff, but when you look at it, you also see the limits, and a lot of them are aware of it. They're busy doing daily defensive things, and they themselves know that unless something larger has changed, that can change. So, for example, I was meeting with uh, Stop, which is a food bank uh, in Toronto that's been doing uh, really good work around uh, 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 green spaces and, and uh, gardens for poor people and childcare and children films. It's not very radical, but it's been doing really good stuff. And I raised with him the question of what, what if we formed, uh, based on something that was happening in, in, in the U.S. called the Center for Labor Renewal, but what if we formed a new organization in the city that tried to organize everybody uh, on, 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 on a class defined broadly? We want representatives of poor people, we want representatives from the NGOs, we want locals, even the locals to join in. But we want to say we want a new working class organization at the city level that organizes everybody in some political way that will form democratic structures that won't just be about how do we help each other, but will also raise questions that each of you aren't raising. And their response was, yes, because we can't change neoliberalism by itself. If there was some structure that was actually taking on neoliberalism in the city, it would help us. And you know, so they offered, for example, to give us a full-time person to work with them. So we have to think about those things. So I think everything has to be changed. We can't just think about this. Usually it's just alliances, and in order to change everything, you need another kind of structure, a party of some kind. You know, I have to think about what, you know, thinking about building these kinds of capacities and what has to be done, that has to drive what kind of a party uh, we need. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to emphasize on this that, you know, even if your objective is simple, even if you said that, look, we're at such, such a stage right now that Maybe all we can do is do some education. <laughs> we just have to appreciate how organizational just that is. You know, spontaneously and uh, you know, just in terms of our voluntary labor, we can organize meetings like this on the weekend. We can do them in Toronto. 
But what if the point was that uh, 100 meetings like this should actually be going on this week? Given what's going on, 100 meetings like this should be going on where people are talking about what's going on. And what if the point is to find out from each of those meetings, actually get a report back, and see where are people really are so we actually understand them. And to get criticisms of what we're throwing out as ideas where people say that. And so great, or do you have other ideas? How do we accumulate that and get that together and organize that and then make a change to what our demands are? And build them. So even education. And then pulling out of that kind of education of people who are interested in doing this. And leading some discussions. And then developing people who are going to lead discussions. And, and, and thinking about things like, well, there are some interesting things going on in Greece right now. Uh, where there wasn't just people, you know, in the, uh, the immigrant, young people in the immigrant neighborhoods riding in, in, in Athens. There was actually, this was going on in every city in Greece. What's going on? And a lot of this was actually actually supported by some of the left parties. Well, what's going on here? Which had links to this? Uh, I mean, France has been a new party. What does that mean? In Germany, there's the Delinquent Party. So, you know, even just the question of education is organizational. So everything comes down to our education. And I want to repeat what I said about work time. Uh, unless we deal with this question of work time and find out, figure out how to put demands on the table, it could be bargaining, it could be national, you know, when we start moving away from, for example, you know, overtime. You know, the minimum demand level. You know, why should all work time be absolutely volunteer? And why should we actually have some collective control over the overtime? So we have to think about this. And that's some of the contradictions to some of those demands. Okay, so let me just conclude. Uh, I think a starting point for all of us is that a crisis in itself will not radicalize people. It might drive by some people, it might pose some questions, it creates opening, but the crisis in itself is not going to do it because people feel too overwhelmed, too on their own, do things, and even think about possibilities. It's not just that you don't do them. I think even, you know, even, uh, I don't know who it was, I think it was Simone, in like 1848, was taking a look at factory workers and wasn't asked, and then didn't ask just how come people are working like this 12 hours a day actually participate in making change? So that's not the question. The question is how can people who are working like this even think about the possibility of change? How can it even occur to them given what their real life is like? So spontaneity isn't going to happen. And to a lot of people, as much as they, you know, if you ask them in 2005 what things were like, they think that Jesus was shaking and the was killing us. Now they'll want to fix the system so we can go back to them. And so spontaneously, it isn't going to work. That's why we have to think about uh, organization. And I think one of the things we have to, have to think about now, I, I don't know, I'm not predicting what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm assuming that capitalism is going to have to work. And if our whole argument is that capitalism is finished and can't survive, then when capitalism muddles through, then you're kind of stuck. I think one of the things we have to learn how to do is to say capitalism uh, is an inhumane system and a barrier to human development even when it's working well. That's actually what we've learned over the last 25 years. Whether you think that capitalism made a progressive role and what it's achieved to say, but from here on in, given what capitalism, you give capitalism all kinds of credit for things it's achieved, but from here on in, capitalism has become a barrier to human development. Capitalism now means permanent insecurity, it means increasing inequality, it means narrowing dimensions all our lives is terrible, and it means this international and we just we have to challenge the system even when it's functioning. That's what we have to do. It's easier way. Maybe it's easier when it's a crisis. And part of that, same point, is we have to begin to understand that there's a polarization of options. Uh, that there isn't actually a comfortable middle ground between these points. You know, we always have to deal with, okay, how do we take our out of the demands and that's what our demands are, how we understand them, and how do we communicate? tactical problem. How do you get people to move because we want to talk to people who aren't particularly politicized? Uh, but that's one question. But we have to understand that there isn't a middle ground. We can't go back to the 60s or the 50s. And it isn't just because when you actually look at it, they weren't that great for women, for poverty, for the third world. They weren't great in a lot of ways. Uh, but the point about how we got to our world was that there was a crisis in the 1860s. And that crisis was very much about capitalism running into 
top of, top inflation, and, and a profit split. And that had to do with the strength of the working class at that moment in time. And that in order to reconstitute themselves, capital had to break the working class. And neoliberalism was focused on breaking the power of the working class. Break the power of the working class, and restructure business, and you can make profits again, you won't have inflation, even if it means slower growth, part of slower growth, and then that will the slow growth at home. Increase your market share abroad. Speed it up globalization. Globalization speeds up, that means more competition. That reproduces control of the world. Finance emerged out of that. The solution to that crisis was to break the working class, and that finance, rather than Keynesian policies, had to be the key. Because as long as you let workers be secure in a class society, they're going to rebel at some point. Or they're not going to give up as much as you want. So since 1980, the point was don't expect wages in general to go up. You want your standard of living to go up, work harder, work longer, go into debt. Capitalism has changed. But we go back to that. We go back to that, we'll have the same question, the same crisis. And the, the, you know, capitalism itself knows that is not middle of the ground solutions. That's why they're doing all these crazy things right now. Now why don't we get as radical as they are but from our perspectives? And that's what we have to do. Get in our heads, as difficult as it is, and then start thinking about what this means. And I, I really want to emphasize it. I don't know what, what a lot of this means. There's going to be a million contradictions and complexities, but we have to treat them as problems, not as excuses. You know, someone's going to say, yeah, if you do that, this will happen. Well, it's true. Then we have to say, okay, well, how would we deal with it? Not therefore we should give up because it's so hard. And that's really the challenge for, I think, this generation. And I say this generation because I don't think it's my generation that's going to do this. So, I'm going to put this responsibility on another generation. I'll stop. <laughs>